most students in this audience would agree that I'm anti-green school. The truth is, I'm much more comfortable in a structured academic environment. I came from a STEM school in New York, and I'd much rather do two weeks of their exams than be up here today. So when it came to thinking about Greenstone, a year ago I told myself, ah, it's a futures alarm problem, and that I'd do something easy, get it done, and well, get out. The easy choice for me would have been to talk about my rally race. I spent one month with my dad rallying through Western Africa, navigating and taking photos, which I even sold for charity. It ticked all the boxes, meaningful, charitable, artistic, celebrated. Very green school. But by block one of my first Greenstone class, I found myself dismissing the idea. I was throwing out the easy win. Now I bet you're wondering why I'd throw away a great story that I wouldn't even have to put much work into. God knows I certainly thought about it. Over the next few weeks, as I pondered about my topic, while getting back into the routine of school, I hung out with my friends like normal. We had spent the summer creating projects for ourselves, evolving from photography to buying and making clothes. I remember one time I was working on a pair of jeans with my friend Kai. And for six hours, I didn't get tired of it. We were in the living room taking materials from different clothes and seeing how we could rework them into jeans, all while watching a four-part documentary about a Canadian cat killer. <laughs> Strangely, though, it was one of the most memorable nights I've had doing something new. It was that night, actually, that I learned how to use a sewing machine. That sewing machine became the inspiration for why I'm standing here today. So how did a kid from New York City, who once had his nose stuffed in a textbook 24-7, find inspiration in a sewing machine? Well, little did I expect that sewing machine would take me on an adventure, not dissimilar to a road trip, a meandering journey to Pasar Kodok with no formulated plan in mind. Whatever caught my attention at the market that day would end up being part of my next creation. But I didn't always finish what I started. I loved what I was doing, but sometimes I changed my mind on something that I'd been working on for two hours. It occurred to me how fundamentally different this type of project is to a school assignment. Restarting an essay after having worked on it for two hours would be the most frustrating feeling. But in creating, there's no right or wrong. Changing my mind didn't mean restarting. It was simply just a step in the process. I, like almost everyone in the US, have been trained since middle school to not be wrong to always know the answers, to follow the steps I was told. There wasn't much room for coming up with and testing my own ideas. I learned what I was told to learn, and I remembered it until I was tested on it. So as a high schooler living in New York, I was constantly the most stressed I've ever been. I was always doing schoolwork, and I used it as an excuse to do little else with my day. I was drowning in stagnation. It felt like my workload was huge, but only recently have I realized that it felt so much more than it actually was. This year as a senior, I've truly had more to do than ever. College applications, AP courses, personal responsibilities, and school on top of that too. However, as the list grew, so did my newfound appreciation for art and creativity. And as I explored fashion, it began to dawn on me that there's a need to express this pent-up creativity. It needs a release. Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk about the link between schooling and creativity has been hailed for highlighting how schools educate creativity out of students. But I'm beginning to think that schools can't do that. 
Certainly, creativity hasn't been magically washed away or educated out of me in spite the highly academic schools I've attended in the past. It isn't school pushing me to go drive up to the forest in the north to take photos or sit on the floor cutting up fabrics to sew with. It is innate and has always been inside of me. I haven't exactly ever seen myself as an artistic person. In fact, I kind of avoided art classes or creating up till this year simply because I didn't think I was very good. But that's not the point. I know I'm not the most talented artist in the world, or even just in my class. I enjoy art because I don't have to be right. Typically, my head is constantly in the future, planning and working. But when I'm sitting on the floor, molding clay, my mind can just be empty of that. I can just make whatever I want, however I want. Experiment with it. Make things that don't make sense, because why not? After all, no one's grading me. Another thing Sir Ken Robinson said is that creativity is just as important as literacy, and it should be treated that way. And I agree with him on this. I'm finally learning to incorporate creativity into my academic lifestyle. From the moment I decided on an artistic greenstone, I had great ambitions about all the crazy and wild art pieces that I would create. Believe it or not, I, a person who prefers structure, chose to go down a rabbit hole of functionless art. And I loved it, because as I discovered, who was to say that an object that has lost its function has also lost its purpose? I think we can all agree that artistic and functional components go hand in hand. Think about your phone, or car, or even IKEA. IKEA's furniture is like store-bought white bread. It's hugely popular, yet plain, simple, and functional. Creatively, the furniture is quite mundane, and it's mass-produced but there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. In my home of Hungary, we have some of the most beautiful furniture made by local craftsmen. Homes filled with these beautiful rugs, sofas, and other furniture made with intricate designs are scarce now, thanks to brands like IKEA. But when I walk into my grandma's apartment, or really any old person's home, my eyes light up jumping around, examining the decorations with excitement. The point is, ne nearly all creative industries, ranging from furniture to clothing, are losing much of the creative genius that is born in the process of creating. Anything that isn't directly part of function is left out. And so in my rabbit hole, I made an insane 65-slide presentation in which I included different designers and contemporary artists. For example, the artist Erwin Worm took the exterior of her car and modified it to look like it had been blown up like a balloon and called it Fat Car. Worm works with mediums that have both functional and artistic components and bans conventional designs. I was so captivated by his art. What is the purpose of a fat car? It can't be driven anymore. What if Worm made it because he thought to himself, why not? Things are more interesting when they're disrupted, wouldn't you agree? For anything I'm told I can't do, I've always been quick to question, why not? I've been in too many situations, especially at school, where I've had conflicts about how I choose to creatively express myself. I've been told to take stickers with profanity off my laptop or change shirts with quote-unquote inappropriate art. Why can't I wear a cool piece of art just because some would find it derogatory? Anyways, I'm still not over that, Harriet. 
so inspired by Worm, I wanted to make a bunch of mind-bending nonsensical art, forcing people to take a different perspective. I jumped straight into making without much thought. I found five old landline phones at my girlfriend's house and that weren't being used, and I thought they'd make for a great piece. I took the phones and I mounted them on an outdoor chair and used wires to hold up the phones as if they were armrests. The best-looking phone I placed directly where you would sit. And I was really satisfied with it. It wasn't an A-grade piece, but it was the largest art project that I'd ever taken on, and I really enjoyed the process. My projects didn't always stem simply from a desire to create functionless art. I found myself driven by more personal history. I always moved around when I was young, from house to house, never staying anywhere longer than two years. And while most of the furniture from my childhood has been either sold or stored away somewhere, my mom's Persian carpets always came with us. She grew up surrounded by my grandma's collection of antique rugs and carpets and has loved them ever since. And so this year, I, did, I decided to buy myself a vintage Afghan rug that I loved so much I wanted to learn to make rugs myself. My mom joked that the last thing she expected to be talking to her 18-year-old son about was yarn quality. This project was the first time I had to go to a store to buy materials. With all my previous projects, I found inspiration from old things laying around. Now, I know I'm not the greenest person here, but I've always been ticked off when perfectly good things are thrown out, even before green school. I've made two rugs, both relatively small, but each taking approximately two weeks. I use a poking tool on a special fabric, stretched out on a frame, looping the yarn in every single little hole. The one with the large eye in the center, I made simply because I thought it'd be really cool. And the other, a multi-textured rug with varied lengths and a fluid structure, because why not? When I was making my rugs, I wasn't exactly excited to be making them. My hands hurt and I was getting blisters too. It felt like a never-ending task. And yet, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to be making interesting decorations for my room, myself. Most of my work are schoolwork, online courses, or university work so it often doesn't feel all that rewarding to complete tasks. If I'm being honest, I know I've never looked back at an essay after submitting it. But now, having a tangible product as the result of my hard work gives me a greater sense of accomplishment and fulfillment. In fact, one of the best feelings I get nowadays is when I finish one of my art projects and admire it or find a spot for it in my room. I don't feel an external push to finish because of a deadline or because I need to. For the first time, it feels like I'm putting in the work. All that finger-numbing work for my own self-satisfaction. You see, I'm always under external pressure. And I always ensure that I rise to those expectations. I'm a person who constantly wants to improve themselves, so I'm compelled to really give things my all. This pressure, although positive, makes me anxious. A part of my head is always occupied with the work that I should be doing, or where I'm lacking, or that I won't be good enough if I want to spend time for myself. But when I've got my hands all muddied with clay, I'm fully immersed in creating. The part of my head that's always thinking forward is scooped up and put off to the side. Nothing needs to make sense anymore. And I feel more balanced now, no longer the same kid from New York City 
riddled with anxiety, consumed by perfecting the outcome, but rather now loving the process, always looking forward to my next creation. I get to be in the moment, right here, right now, a creator in my flow state. So today, I challenge you, go buy a brick of clay or start an art project just because. Why not? I did. Thank you.